early doors. Um, welcome to the Agricology Tent. Um, Agricology is a community of researchers and farmers sharing knowledge on agroecology. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. Um, so uh, I've just introduced Tom Martin, who is going to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you. Katie, uh, am I on? No. 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 <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and let me add my um, my welcome to the Agricology Discussion Tent. Um, I'm really excited to be here today, and we've got uh, a great panel of, um, of speakers today. Uh, what a great way to start the No-Till Show than uh, by having a little look inside the brains of some of these um, practitioners and have a little amble through their experiences. So um, um, the format of the session will be that um, each of them will just give a, a brief introduction, who they are, what they do, uh, and their experience, and, um, and then we'll have questions. So do... Do get your questions ready, um, ask as many, as detailed, as, uh, and as difficult questions as you like. Um, but I thought we'd just start with a show of hands. So who here would describe themselves as a, as a no-till practitioner? Perhaps you have been doing it for a number of years, okay. Who would say that they're just, just getting into no-till in the last couple of years? Okay, and who's interested in no-till but perhaps isn't practicing at the moment? Uh, just starts, okay, so but a pretty, pretty even. Uh, and I should also ask, who, who has livestock in their system? Okay, that's really interesting. So we've got a really great spread this morning. Well, three years ago, uh, two years ago, in fact, I would have been in the camp of the people who are just interested in no-till, um, but don't have any experience at the moment. And so I'm, I'm really at the, right at the beginning of my no-till journey. So I'll be asking um, questions from a very kind of fresh-faced, possibly naive perspective, um, but hopefully it should be helpful as, as we go through. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce um, our, our first uh, panel member. Um, I, so, before I was a farmer, I used to work in the film industry and I would introduce um, premieres and screenings. So uh, I was always told, don't, don't say the name of the film until, until the last thing. So I'll, I'll say that with the, with the name of the people. So our first speaker comes from the Cambridgeshire, Bedfordshire, Northamptonshire border. And they farm nearly a thousand hectares in a varied rotation. Uh, he has um, managed to combine his love of his wife and cricket by producing a cricket mad son, uh, which is a great, great thing to do, great way to do it. And uh, uh, he also has a daughter just entering her teens, so some difficult years ahead. Um, uh, he's a 2014 Nuffield Scholar with the heading No-Till Under Any Conditions. Please welcome Russ McKenzie. Thank you, Tom. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. Can I thank you everywhere? That was wonderful. Brilliant. Um, so, I'm first up today because I was the last getting here, so someone gets a pedant, but uh, I'm just going to give you just a brief intro of, of what we've done over the farm over the past few years. So. I think for me, taking on no on how we did it is probably summed up in these three words, you know, patience, flexibility and opportunity, um, mm. choosing the right time to, to get crops established, being flexible in your approach and, and taking the opportunities when they arise is probably one of the, the main things for us. Um, you know, we've learned lessons along the way, sometimes we haven't got everything right, but uh, sometimes that's how you um, get success out of learning from your mistakes. If I look back historically about where we've been, we start off with a shallow tillage based system. Um, my father-in-law was quite a, an advocate of uh, trying you know, new things and so he's never keen on ploughing. We started off on the mental approach, that was quite successful for us. Um, we moved from there towards a, a strip to dish type approach. We found that actually we were still getting good yields with, um, without having to do the cultivations. Um, and then having gone through and done a your scholarship, I wanted to learn more about direct drilling and this is where we are today. So our simple pretty much a, a simple system what we've got. We've got a converted Porsche Sprinter. Um, we run it on uh, narrow Dutch openers. We also use the poor gold VOS openers. And for us, that system works pretty well at the moment. In an ideal world, I'd like to have uh, a disc drill coupled with that as well, and that, that would be my perfect scenario. Um, unfortunately, sometimes trying to get two drills through across the books um, doesn't always work when you work for someone, but um, that's where we've got to today. But it all starts here. You hear lots of talk about soil and soil health. If you look at the soil sample on the right hand side that is probably where we are on our heavy clay soils yeah initially we had 10 years of shallow tillage um, looking to produce our, our tillage approach and that's the result of 10 years shallow tillage followed by it's now into its fifth year of no-till lots of good fissuring and cracks through the soil you can see the roots getting through it um, you compare it to the soil sample on the left hand side and that's the contrast what we've got across the farm so we've got five different units three of those are in no-till and two aren't quite there yet and, and this is the reason why that particular field we've only been farming that ground for a couple of years now has got a history of continual straw removal with nothing going back in um, cultivation to the same depth in wet conditions year after year and basically what happens that soil is, is pretty dead 
there's not a lot of life going there. We're having to restructure annually. Um, compared to other soils, it's not holding structure. So for us, it's being flexible in our approach on that one. Uh, we will get there, um, but that's just not quite ready yet to take on no-till compared to the other ones. Um, worms are pretty important. There's far more educated than, than me who <laughs> told you about worms. But So this is really interesting. This is when we did the Monis Farm program. We had um, Rob Simmons from Cranfield come out to look at our soil. And those red straws are the deep anisic worm burrows. So um, it's just a very simple way of seeing where all these deep burrowing worms um, have got to. There's about 22, I think, across that profile pit there. And so every time you've got one of those going through, they're opening channels up in the soil, um, you know, for nutrients, roots, water, etc., etc. Um, yeah, and worms are your best friend at the end of the day. Um, you can get very carried away with soil tests. There's lots of questions about you know, what is the right soil test, how deep should you test, um, what should it tell you. Um, this is one we had come back recently from our Yen one. Um, all very wonderful, it says we're you know, very high, good soil microbial activity. It's great, but I think the key thing is you know on your own farm um, whether your soil's in the right condition, whether it can take no-till. You know, we find with our soils now is that they're, they're better at holding onto water a little bit longer, but they transport it away when it's a bit wetter as well. It's because we've got that soil in the right condition. Um, but really interestingly, the, the P and K tests aren't on here, but we've hardly put any bank P and K on in the past 12 years, um, and our P indices haven't dropped there in the two to three region. Um, we put a bit of DAP on for all seed rate. We put very very little bank P on. And I think the key bit with that is that as your soils start working better for you, um, they start giving more back. Um, we started growing cover crops about five years ago um, and we started off in, in a quite a low base, we grew about 40 hectares till we learned what worked for us and what, what didn't. Um, we put about 300 hectares in now um, and what we're finding with that is that um, A, we're capturing nutrients, we'll capture circa 35 to 40 kilograms of nitrogen annually. The question mark really is when that is coming back to the following crops. We find it's probably about two to three years later um, that's starting to come back in. But the beauty about this is it's opening up the soil profiles, keeping the soil in good condition. In a wet season, it's transporting water away for us. Um, the key bit is the destruction timing for us. And we've done it in a number of ways. We've had um, sheep on farm. Good managed grazing is really important. We find with cover cropping, especially on heavy ground, you don't want them overgrazing it. Um, and just enough so in the spring, you can um, get the elements to the soil surface to allow you to have a, a good friable layer. Um, and good dry conditions. Um, we've also looked at rolling our cover crops as well. So we did this last winter as an experiment to see if we could reduce the amount of glyphosate usage we had. Um, and that's the result compared to where we didn't roll it. Literally that was within 10 days. Um, my biggest fear with, with that is that we'd have a big green mat and wouldn't allow the surface to dry in the spring. But we actually found actually the material disappeared pretty quickly. We had really good conditions to drill into in the spring. Um, and I think it's something that if you're not worrying about targeting black grass, it works really well. Um, we're still quite reliant on glyphosate, there's no doubt about that for us, but it's another way of just trying to reduce um, the amount of sprays we do, we're doing. And so talking about black grass, um, and this is an experiment that we've done three times and we've found it pretty successful. So we're looking to put a catch crop in, um, say after all seed rate for example, and what we're doing is don't worry too much about what the catch crop is. The principle we're trying to achieve or what I wanted to, to do was be able to keep no tilling um, but to maximise our black grass control window so I wanted the conditions to drill into successfully in October so catch crops uh, planted um, early August at latest end of July they're growing the whole time the key bit with those is to make sure they're not too thick so you're not shading the black grass plants when you come around spraying but what we're finding here is, is that's keeping pumping moisture out in a wet season keeps the soil condition nice and friable um, and we're drilling into some nice conditions in the second half of, of October. Um, maybe slightly out of the box, um, but for us it's working for us to keep us on the road we want to go to and um, so we've repeated that three times and, and it's worked pretty successfully each time. If you look, this is what we did this year, this is a field where we cultivated the strips, this is the same field where we cultivated, we've got the black grass heads you can see there. And this bit here, this is where we did the short-term cover crop, um, catch crop, sorry, short-term catch crop, sprayed it off and drill, drilled it into. So I'd argue, again, it comes back to this disturbance scenario is that actually we probably may have brought some black grass up in depth, but in that scenario we haven't actually helped our black grass control program. Um, and it's quite nice to see that, uh, that change. So I call this downward trends leading to upward stability, and this is just probably to end on my sort of four key points of, of what we're seeing. Um, so our diesel consumption has gone down quite dramatically. Um, we're using 17,000 litres less 
diesel and lead and when we were by using a bigger, uh, a smaller area probably about 10 years ago. And nitrogen requirements come down now, so we tend to find that we can get optimum yields with circa somewhere between 160 to 180 kilograms of nitrogen compared to 210 to 240. Um, initially in those early days of no-till we may have wanted to keep those nitrogen rates up, but as the soil is stocking in better, um, we're finding we're not having to push those levels quite so much. Um, our herbicide inputs have come down as well, so our black grass can program now is probably a good 30 to 40 pounds a hectare less than where it would have been back in our cultivation days. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we've got pretty stable P levels, um, and more importantly, our crop yields are stable as well. So there's sort of fear about do you get a drop off in yield? Mm -hmm. I, I must admit, I mean, Clive may say something um, along the same lines, but I don't think we've really seen a yield drop, which is key as well. So just a final thought, and Tom has mentioned my love of cricket, and this is um, this is my son who has scored probably more runs than me in a year than I've spent in 30 years. Um, but unlike the England cricket side yesterday, um, to get the best from your souls is like any good cricket innings. Um, very good platform leads to greater things. So thank you very much for listening. And well, and over to the next question. Fantastic, thank you, Russ. I think one of the criticisms of farming as an industry is we don't make it very easy for, for new entrants. So it's great to welcome um, uh, a first generation farmer. Um, he farms in Norfolk with his wife and daughter and began direct drilling in 2012, immediately introducing, uh, introducing grass into the system. Please welcome Humphrey Mills. Good morning. Um, I could get this to work. Maybe it's a little one. Uh, yes, um, he may have said oh, I farm in Norfolk, but I started off farming in Norfolk in a small way, but we now farm in Essex. And we've got about 150. Am I going backwards? Uh, what shall I start? Uh, I can't what I I'll try and um, I'll try and uh, start talking about um, uh, no-till and what could possibly go wrong. Um, <laughs> I'll come back to that slide. So basically, um, yes, we bought our farm in 2006 um, and we um, uh, joined, we had started off with a contract farming agreement with a local contractor. Um, that all went very well. <coughs> so I decided to um, stop doing that. Um, and we took the farm in hand um, and joined the higher level scheme to sort of de-risk the business and start making the farm a bit more environmental. These are the areas of the farm that we're paid not to farm. Um, and our cropping, after various uh, attempts at, um, we're, we're based around wheat like most people. Um, and this year we've only got two other crops, um, oats and um, rape, which we've, the rape we've established as a cover crop on the, <coughs> uh, to, um, as a cover crop with the rape in it and to see if it would survive, hoping it wouldn't because I hate growing rape. But anyway, it seems to have survived. Um, spring oats are the, probably the, the uh, spring crop that does best in our system. We tried, uh, we tried um, spring oat, spring beans, spring wheat, spring barley. They're all, they don't do as well. But the driver of the business is the is the first wheat, and um, we're attempting the second wheat this year. So um, we built up a, a machinery fleet. Um, but the big winner here is, you know, that, that everything's much lighter now. Um, but the diesel cost is £20 a hectare, and it, we use about four litres a hectare to establish the crops. We had a flock, flock of breeding ewes, which um, kind of paid for the machinery, really. I, <coughs> I got to the um, 
a stage in life where um, I'd done enough shepherding. Um, we now do a land joint venture with a chap who bought a lot of breeding stock from us. Uh, that was last about October time. Um, so, um, and as Russ was saying, um, it, it's a, it's, you need to destroy a cover crop somehow. And it's a good way of exposing the black grass to the sun and the wind in the spring. And then you go into a spring drilling situation after that. Um, once the sheep went, we had um, a lot more opportunity to, um, to grow grass because <coughs> we were actually contracted under our HLS agreement to um, to maintain our grassland area, so I decided to try a herbal lay, and um, that's what it looks like. Um, that's what's in it. Um, I'll answer questions about that if, um, if you're interested. But what we're doing with it is we're mob grazing it, which is a, a, a new thing for us, or it was when we started doing it. Um, that's what it looks like from the air. You, it's basically a continual lane with um, paddocks going around it and there's a water pipe going around here so every paddock's got access to water we just move the trough along with each one and so by the time they get back to the beginning they're always on the oldest oldest paddock <coughs> i'm sure you know that not crazy so um i took if i go back to the first slide which maybe i won't um the reason I took, took that first photo is that um, I, I, I've been in the pub in the afternoon and I should have gone and looked at the cattle because it was raining all day <clears throat> and that just looked like a slurry lagoon <clears throat> and I took that photo because um, already two days after I'd um, moved the cattle off it was recovering and this is one week later and that's only two weeks after what, what looked like a complete disaster. And to me, that sort of embodies the, the resilience and the ability of soil to, to grow stuff without us putting great new machines through it. Um, and you can't actually see where that is now in the, in the same field. And it, you know, there's you know, chicory plants up, up here. Um, and um, so that, that was the sort of interest and I think it's probably because there's a livestock element in there as well that it has that recovery effect that's my journey into no-till I know um, my, uh, my dad went to New Zealand some years ago and came back and he'd look, been staying with some relatives and they had a mob grazing system and uh, as a kind of um, smart aleck British farmer he said oh you know but you get a lot of rain out here what do you do surely you just then let the cattle onto more land and he said no we actually let them on into smaller paddocks because we know they're going to mess up the grass when it gets really wet and we just rather that was contained over a, over a small area so it's really interesting to see that thank you thank you Humphrey. Um, <laughs> Our final speaker is the co-founder of Direct Driller Magazine and also the Farming Forum. He is the 2016, the very first Soil Farmer of the Year, and as the Soil Masters demonstrate, are you making this up? As the Soil Masters demonstration farmer, uh, married with two children, uh, aged six and eight, farming in Staffordshire. Uh, he grows uh, a variety of crops. In fact, the first time I came across him, he was talking about growing payola. Um, which, is, which is very interesting, perhaps he'll talk about that at some point. Um, he, it was last year the Oxford Farming Conference uh, emerging leader, but really I think he's already there. Um, please welcome Clive Bailey. Uh, morning, thanks Tom. Um, I don't need this first slide really, um, with the introduction because it's all done now. Um, but uh, healthy profits, that's what it's all about, because uh, the reason we all do this is, is to pay the bills at Waitrose at the end of the day. Um, so this is, this is uh, yeah, very much brief, overview of uh, the changes I've made in my business in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so who am I? Uh, don't really need this, Tom's already mentioned. Uh, TWB Farms is the farm business I'm managing partner there. Um, the Farming Forum and Direct Driller Magazine are also uh, things I'm responsible for. Uh, we've been a rapidly expanding and quite diversified business over, last, uh, over my management, kind of last 20 years. 
um, particularly the farm side of things, which has grown uh, from a from a 200 acre dairy farm to a, to a large scale contract farming uh, arable business today. Um, all arable, combined all crops. Uh, I've always said that, but what I've come to realise in more recent years is I am and always have been a livestock farmer. The livestock below our feet is abundant and just like you know, livestock above the ground, cows and sheep, if you don't feed it, look after it, it doesn't do so well. So I've learnt really that I, I'm, I'm not just a combinable crops or arable farmer, I'm as livestock as a man who's got a thousand cows, I guess. Uh, our soils are generally light, uh, medium loams, uh, no proper man's land or any of that scary, really heavy stuff with terrible black grass problems, so I can't claim to solve all those kind of problems. Um, low cation exchange capacities and generally drought prone. Um, we have some heavier soils, uh, yeah, there's the scale that we're farming at now, we've got a bit of everything quite frankly, but none of the really heavy Essex clays that, uh, that real farmers talk about. Um, it's all uh, either owned FBTs, but the majority is contract farmed. So, you know, this isn't a hobby. I'm accountable to those, those landlords and those contract farming customers. If we don't make them a profit, they kick me out and get somebody in that can. Conservation agriculture now for 10 seasons. Uh, before that, 15 year or so period of, uh, of min till, uh, although I use that word quite loosely now because there's not a lot minimum about 600 horsepower tractors, um, but uh, min till as a lot of people would, would refer to it before that. So it's a long time since we've seen a plough really. Uh, and uh, we farm differently, or so I've always said, but maybe not so much now. Uh, this is a quick video, if it'll play. That, uh... That's it. So, right, so this is typically how we're kind of putting our crops in. This was last, uh, early November last year, and yeah, I did get a drone for my birthday last year. Um, <laughs> we're putting beans there in after wheat. There's a, a very short term, quick growing cover crop. Uh, been, been putting that field between. In that case, cheap and cheerful mustard, sunflower and linseed. Fast growth, aim being just biomass, because this was a block of land I was doing a bit of experiment to um, experiment with, with this likelihood that we may lose glyphosate in the future. So I think like a few of the no-till farmers have been experimenting with the possibility of what will we do in that situation. Um, so my aim of this crop was to try and grow um, this particular 150 acre block of beans without glyphosate, which normally, uh, the drill would be followed by the sprayer to, to kill off uh, that cover crop but in this case we're working on the idea of relying on weather and frost and the species we've used um, so basically get through these that was that crop of beans about two weeks ago um, and at that point no inputs whatsoever have, have gone on that so no glyphosate no uh, no post-emergent heart or pre-em pre or post-emergent herbicide um, just using seed rate, the mulch of the cover crop, and timing to kind of uh, to kind of grow us a crop without the herbicide. So, you know, relatively successful. Um, it has since had um, a pass with a fungicide. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be organic here. Uh, we're a conventional farm that uses you know, work technology and still aiming for maximum kind of output from our crops. Um, but you know, it's showing that I think there are ways forward, even if we do lose the, the glyphosate in the future. Maybe ways that we can do that. Um, so basically, I'm not all about no-till, which is a common misconception. You know, no-till is part of a system. My farming system, I'd rather refer to as conservation agriculture. The three pillars to that are, of course, the minimum mechanical soil disturbance. So that's the no-till bit, the, the, the trendy bit that we can all go out and buy fancy drills for. Um, but more importantly are these second two points, keeping a permanent soil organic cover and diversification, species diversification within our cash crops, our cover crops, uh, and, and diverse wide rotations. That to my mind is more important than the two other points that we've put together uh, and applies to farms that, that cultivate as well. So um, that really is what I'm about, not just about the no-till thing, that oversimplifies what is a complicated thing. Why did we make these changes? Um, sustainability, financially, environmentally, you know, you just kind of, it's, it's fairly clear to see when you've been involved in it for a short time that uh, the sustainability of large horsepower tractors um, and, uh, and also our financial dependency on subsidies uh, is, is not exactly the route for the future. Um, also understanding that, you know, as a farmer, my primary asset was my soil. So I needed to maximise the output from that and also the weather that we're given. So, you know, what water and sunlight that we do get, I need to maximise um, capturing that and turning it into stuff that I can sell. Uh, ag subs in the future, uh, now I did these slides a long time ago, but uh, it's getting closer and closer by the day, it seems, that obviously we're going to be subsidised probably in very different ways going forward, uh, if at all. So, you know, I wanted to create a business that wasn't dependent on those subsidies to, to, to stay in business. And also, it's been a big unique selling point for my contract farming business. Um, it's differentiated from other contract farming um, 
providers in the area uh, and uh, and meant that we're not just in a race to the bottom competing on price to take on you know acres in some kind of megalomania arable farmer kind of way that some people seem to get very obsessed with um, you know we, we have a unique selling point and can offer something different to our, our land earning customers um, this unsustainability you know, agriculture's reliance that's increased over the last kind of couple of decades. Um, bag and bottle farming. We are completely reliant on these bag and bottle solutions to all of our problems. And I wanted to get away from that and get more reliance on soil health, um, because you know, and, and all the biology and uh, and that wonderful soil food web, which is a whole you know, day's discussion in itself. But basically, letting these guys um, replace those bags and bottles as far as possible, because that healthy soil. I think fundamentally leads to healthier plants and healthy plants do better, yield better, don't need the insecticides, don't need the kind of constant uh, application of artificial inputs, synthetic inputs we've been using. And we see it everywhere in, in nature, you know, it's that nature is constantly trying to evolve for the better. Um, plants do exactly the same thing and I think this goes through, you know, plants, humans, animal world, it's just, you know, it starts to make a lot of sense and the more you are around it when you farm under the system, the more you see. That, uh, that less is more and the healthier plant that you get, that kind of less dependent you are on those synthetic inputs. And I think a lot of problems that we have today as farmers, you know, if you, if you, if you, you did a survey of farmers, blackgrass, aphids, slugs, the weather, you know, and access to land, I, I think, you know, we're all pretty good at moaning about all these problems, but I think the problem we've got as farmers is we're looking at them all as the problems rather than identifying them and seeing them for what they really are, which is symptoms and that symptom of the real issue is that soil health has been declining over the last couple of generations uh, and you know brought with it those kind of problems so get that soil health back a lot of these problems or symptoms as I'd say they are start to go away um, I've just picked past one can't go back with this but basically it's also understanding that um, you know my, that water particularly on my light, light land soil is really one of my limiting factors for yield and that was really how I came across this whole kind of change and conservation agricultural system 15 years or so ago now. It was visiting farmers in drier countries and seeing how they manage their water and how important that was. So this picture was taken with that drone again, um, this time last year when it was very dry um, and I'm glad to say these aren't my crops, this was looking east over my neighbour's crops and they're all starting to die off rather than ripen because they're running out of moisture in that kind of long hot period that we kind of had about, it was about an hour last year. Um, turn the drone around 180 degrees, looking over my own crops, and that's the same day from the same position. Same soil type, you know, there's other differences, different varieties, different farmers, whatever, but the key difference being we've increased our soil organic matters and we're using what water we did get that season better. Um, put them side by side and, you know, you'd think it was a different day or a different crop or a different part of the country, but quite honestly, that's literally just turning a drone around 180 degrees, comparing one farm to an next and one, one system to another now. Unfortunately, it didn't get any wetter and about a week later mine looked just like the stuff of my neighbours. <laughs> but, but, you know, at that time of year, I, th I think the numbers are something like 0.2 tonnes of a hectare per day, greener longer, so, you know, maybe that was worth an extra tonne to the hectare um, on, on my bottom line. So, you know, I'm achieving my primary output now, which is utilising that water far, far better than we used to. Uh, and this is coming for into yield, so comparing <laughs> five-year rolling averages, 2005 to 12, and then more recently 2012 to 5, um, touching on, on what Russ said, you know, we certainly haven't seen a yield drop. Our yields have improved. Um, I'm not putting this all down to system. Varieties have got better. There's difference in seasons. Fungicides have got better. All sorts of reasons. But we're certainly not seeing a, a decrease. This isn't a low input, low output system for me. It's the holy grail of low input but high output. Um, so I'm still aiming for that high output. And, you know, yields are improving, uh, which is good. Uh, and this is against the background of obviously very big fixed cost savings, uh, which Humphrey touched upon. So we basically, if I compare my business of, of 10 years ago to today, uh, today's business has a fixed cost structure that is half of what it was 10 years ago, um, which is the kind of the kind of you know the change that you need if you want to be able to arable farm in this country without subsidy. Uh, and it kind of proves this thing that basically what is making sense of the environment because there's could go on for hours about the environmental benefits of this kind of system. Um, it's actually making sense for our wallets as well, which is, you know, that healthy profits bit right at the start. So my farming principles, just quickly, because we've been questions. I think it's not me time to think. So uh, basically, key things that I kind of rules that I farm by. Always wanting something growing. You know, if you have if you have thousands of acres of turn solar panels. Why you'd be mad to turn them off in August and September, and you know, for, you, just, you want them running maximum time. So thinking of land like a solar panel, always having something capturing that sunlight and that water and nutrition. Um, you'd otherwise lose.
Yeah, that's what I said. 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 Yeah, that's what